Warning, this game contains a few themes people may find disagreeable, such as graphic violence, involuntary body modification, sexual content and imagery, which I will censor, infanticide, slavery, and... Okay, that was a jumbled mess, and it would have told you nothing, so let me elaborate on that warning a bit. This is a game where, in the penultimate scene, just before the climax, pun intended, our second protagonist, whose chest has literally been ripped open by the first protagonist, Jax, another pun intended, his erect wiener into a motorized flashlight, which extracts his electric mutagenic nut and uses it to power a robot, which then cuts his skull to connect his exposed brain to an artificial neural network of many other people who have acted as a master race over various slave races. He then uses that network to take control of a pregnant artificial person, a homunculus, which is built out of the necrotic decomposing flesh of probably his own people, which he uses to repeatedly stab himself in the liver to keep himself awake while he pilots that same homunculus psychically into a tear in the universe to create some kind of god being. He then gets jumped by the first protagonist and turned into a tree. If anything I just described sounds like it's too much for you to handle, I do not blame you. This game contains topics that are not suited for any decent person. I find the fact that it goes this far to be kind of hilarious, and I find the way that the story is told to be kind of interesting, because there actually is a story, and if you're careful, you can find it. So that's why I'm talking about it. But if you can't handle the, the themes of that story, uh, I've got a lot of tamer videos, and you should go watch those instead. Also, this video definitely wouldn't be monetized even if I could get monetized, which I can't because of my channel size. So if you want to help me change that, uh, subscribe. I make all kinds of stuff and it's all quality. Okay, everyone who is here now truly wants to be here. So let's begin deep in the history, the lore of Scorn. A lot of this is up to individual interpretation, so I'll try my best to explain how I made these connections and why I think they are correct as I go. The story begins with a rift in space and time, a tear which emits radiation and white light and some kind of signal which disrupts and disables traditional electronic devices. Somehow this rift arrived on the surface of a planet which once held life and after touching down, immediately that life was sterilized off the planet. All traces of it are now gone, and the only proof that we have that it was still there is in the oxygen-rich atmosphere remaining. The rift began sinking lower to the planet, absorbing more and more of the rock and debris surrounding it in a perfect radial circle until it was thousands of feet below the surface level in a ring-shaped canyon it had created. And this is where the ancestor species of the people of Scorn come in. These were either the native people of this world who had dodged the catastrophe by going off-world, or they were explorers from space who came seeking out the rift. We don't know which one they were specifically, but we do know that upon approaching the rift in their ship, it immediately stopped working and crashed into the surface of the planet. What survivors there were had only survived because they ejected themselves from the ship in drop pods, and those drop pods now litter the otherwise barren ring-shaped canyon. Now these people should have died here, that should have been where their story ended, with a slow march to starvation, but something happened as they approached the rift on the planet's surface. Exposure to it began to change them. The first of these changes they likely noticed came in the form of a mutation, which had turned at least one of the women of this species into a large tree-like humanoid creature. Human on the top half, tree on the bottom half. This creature grew egg-shaped flowers at the base, which upon flowering, people would emerge fully grown from them, already with some amount of intelligence and personality. And this was the first bit of hope that the survivors had, and they began studying the rift more and more. <laughs> Lord forgive me for what I'm about to do. <laughs> At some point, they realize the cause of this mutation. Exposure to the rift, well, it turned a dude's ejaculate into electrojaculate. The cum shot into cum shock, if you will. <laughs> they, <laughs> the nut began glowing white and could be used to power machinery 
and would mutate any organic, living, fleshy substance it touched. Yes, this is actually what the white stuff is. These mutations would generally make living creatures become larger and stronger than they were before, and often it would give them some kind of plant-like properties. We don't know exactly why, Oh my god, it's because another term for sperm is seed. The people of this world eventually came to understand how to use the mutagenic cum shock as a power source, and they created a large ship in an attempt to escape the planet, as this was back when they were still trying to leave this world and leave the rift behind. Some people didn't want to escape. Some people thought that the future of this species lied in using the mutagenic effects of the cum shock to create an even more advanced race by combining what they could of their own people. They were basically trying to build God. The ship was still built. We don't know if they finished making it to the point where it could fly or if they just made the base of it before changing course. Uh, it's the much larger escape vessel that most of the game takes place in, which has, it's clearly got exhaust things in the back of it that would be used as a ship to propel itself in space. It's unknown if it ever actually did leave the ground, but we do know it definitely didn't escape the planet, as its final resting place would be settled where we find it in the game. Technological developments after this point turned only to using the rift to create ever more superior and superior beings. Flesh, which had been exposed to the rift, became a powerful building material and could be powered by the cum shock to make technology. Eggs harvested could be mutated into a variety of things, and eventually these people began artificially seeding the walls of the Ring Canyon with rift-affected eggs, which would be exposed to a small amount of the rift-affected cum shock to form flowering pods to basically mass-produce more members of this now genetically created master race. Because after some development, these beings would emerge already knowing everything they would need to know in order to continue on with the work of creating this god being. Labor had become too much of a demand for just these people though, and there wasn't enough flesh and blood to fit the needs to build the machines that they needed. So the giant ship that never flew was turned into a factory which would produce and distribute a slave subspecies they had intentionally created through mutation. Likely around this point, the rift stopped becoming an object of study to these people, and it began to become some sort of object of worship. A temple began to be built to worship the rift, as the idea of totally combining this master race into some kind of god being became more and more appealing. Tools were made from the flesh and bones of the slave race, which would be used to operate the machinery. The cult began specifically worshipping depictions of sex and sex organs, as those were what was most profoundly affected by the rift, and they experimented more and more with direct exposure to harvested eggs. This led to the creation of a new species, which would grow in its eggs for a long while, excreting a red fluid into its eggs as it did. This red fluid could be harvested in small amounts and used as an injected panacea, which could seemingly heal any amount of physical trauma done to the master race. The beings in these eggs were incredibly strong and resilient, so much so that even their skin was bulletproof. However, this creature would die the moment it left its egg and was exposed to air and the atmosphere. But this turned out to also be an advantage for the master race, as the dead flesh could, after some processing, be removed and used for further experimentation. You could say that this was a golden age for these people. Unless you were one of the slave or experimental races, you would be living a life of biologically designed purpose. One where injury and illness was a thing of the past. Even the founders had been immortalized and entombed in stone statues adorning either side of the rift, and the march towards this long-kept dream carried on for generations. That is when everything went bad, as exposure to the electric boogaloo mutated any flesh that it touched, which began to lead to the monsters. Ant-like beings which would spit acid and devour anyone they could find. Beings that looked like a featherless bird which would spit sharpened projectiles at bullet speed. A large brute would attack with the momentum of a Ford F-150. The, <laughs> the war against the monsters had begun with a slaughter against the master race, as nearly every fresh hatchling was naked and unarmed in the canyon being slaughtered by monsters which emerged from the same lines of flesh that were used to grow these hatchlings. In a panic, weapons were developed, first guns, then shotguns, and finally a grenade launcher. The same package which was used to hold the red healing liquid was now refitted to also hold ammunition as the war raged ever onward. 
the master race was at a horrific disadvantage, as the use of the technology was literally what created these beings. The more they made weapons to defend themselves, the more they developed infrastructure and defense, the more outnumbered they would become. They began growing hyper-intelligent fetuses with extreme aggression, mass-producing them to be fit into suits of armor, which would blast grenades all around them. But as they could not control these HIF, they had to turn them on large volumes of monsters and then avoid them until they were destroyed. This led to the HIF running rampant and destroying much of the facilities, which likely caused most of the damage that we see today. They managed to keep the monsters out of the temple, but the ship and the slaves were lost. Without the labor force, the master race wouldn't last long, so all technology was shut down. The last eggs were left to slowly absorb energy and hatch likely centuries down the line. The master race retreated into the temple, and then they waited. Years, decades, maybe even longer passed. The monsters, now without food or reproductive supplies, became dormant. They began fusing into walls of flesh which would pepper the facilities. Most of the slaves had been killed, save for a few, which were left sealed in metal, which the monsters couldn't chew through. Look at that flange go! <coughs> Look, at that. <coughs> Look at that flange go, man! <laughs> Fuck. What was left of the master race had all connected to a neural network, in which they slumbered, waiting for the final member of their species to arrive and see their dreams to fruition. The ant-like beings had formed ropes across a dead ship, which would never fly and the world of Scorn was silent. An egg hatched. A fresh member of the slumbering master race crawled desperately across the canyon, after a long time of slowly approaching the slave production facility, which was also the only transportation matrix to reach the temple, they fell through a crack in the ground, likely weakened due to the explosions during the war. As soon as they hit the ground below, they blacked out in front of a door. The game begins with that scene, along with one other scene, which I'm not going to mention yet because chronologically, that takes place at the very end of the game. I'll explain that at the end, but for now, we have our first protagonist. And from now on, I will call them first. When first awoke, they only knew that it was time to finish the experiment, and they immediately set to work. They were inside the slave production facility. First, they raised one of the slave members. Depending on your choices here, this crippled slave was deemed either so physically deformed that it was killed, or was deemed allowed to help, and was not killed, but was immediately abandoned after it helped you open the door, trapping it in a machine which is designed to only be used by the master race and the homunculi. So it horribly starved to death. Okay, I actually want to take a, a quick aside to talk about something here. I streamed this game on Twitch, and me and my Twitch chat named the the slave guy Andrew, and Mr. I don't know in my Twitch chat made a little meme about about what happened to him, and I'm just gonna play that right now because it really does perfectly encapsulate <laughs> Andrew's fate. Look, look, Mr. I don't know made this meme. He made it for us just now. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it went down. You can choose for yourself which of those is the less horrible option when you play the game. With the door open, first then advances to the power production facility. And after some quick use of the technology, they got their hands on the gun-like extending tool, which was used to operate most of the technology in this world. They began powering the facility up again, which powers the transport of the entire complex sprawled across the canyon. They power on the machines and the reinvigorated drones were to life. Now freshly filled with electric boogaloo, they began spraying it onto the surrounding flesh machinery, which brings the facility back to life. Starting with a large pylon in the middle of the facility, which acts as the main power supply for the transportation network. They do this by having drones bring over three large capsules which are filled with the electric cum shock. There was a problem though. The cum shock had been sat in those tubes, fermenting in the rift energy for years before being supplied to those capsules. It was more than a little bit overcharged, and this machine was more than a little bit old. 
After plugging in the last capsule, the entire power supply for the main transportation network overloads and explodes. The concussive blast incapacitates First, who stares helplessly as the overcharged Boogaloo starts pouring out, drowning them in what is, canonically, the grossest death in video game history. <laughs> no! No! <laughs> no! No, I don't want to die like this! <laughs> I don't want to die like this! This is the worst way to go! Or is it? See, first didn't die. They actually survived. I missed this on my first playthrough, but after looking back over the game, I realized the electric nutter butters can't kill people. It's literally pumped along those lines of flesh to grow the people in the eggs on the canyon wall. It's a mutagenic, one that's so strong that after being nutted in once, a woman transformed into a tree being and gave birth to several different creatures who are fully grown and already intelligent. It can merge any organic creature, and our dear first protagonist just got buried in a hyperactive, overcharged form of it, all while holding an organic tool which was used to open doors and operate machinery. This organic tool is made of the same flesh. It, too, is alive, and the shocking splooge did what it does best, and it merged them. They were buried underneath that for years, slowly mutating, slowly changing, while it crusted and dried around them. A fate worse than death, and enough to drive anyone insane. Years pass, and the second protagonist wakes up. He, and I am gonna say he because of the whole having a fat wiener thing, and also because the first protagonist is still gonna be a character in the game and will constantly be involved in the story moving forward, so having different pronouns makes it easier to differentiate them. So second wakes up inside of his egg. After prying himself free, he almost dies from the fall, but narrowly he manages to survive, and after a long concussion nap, he rips the umbilical cord out of his stomach and marches across the ring canyon. It's at this point that we get to see the crashed ship from the outside more clearly. We also get to see the piles of corpses caused by the monster war, and his ancestral species rotting inside of one of the drop pods who didn't quite manage to survive the drop. He walks across fields of crashed life pods, corpses and eggs, lines of flesh, and empty, sandy, windy nothing. He arrives at the exhaust end of the large spaceship. He slowly circles the ship, finding that it's been completely shuttered and shut down, except for one area, the power production facility, which had its shutters lifted and a gray, crusty material has spread out across the ground, like a sweaty lava cast that has long since hardened. He finds that a door had been opened and he walks in. Immediately, he sees an unknown creature on four legs, with a tail swinging to and fro, connected to that tail is the exact same multi-tool his species needs in order to open doors and use most of the technology here. That's right, ladies and lords, this monster is the first protagonist. A lot of people, myself included, missed this detail on our first playthrough, but if you pay attention closely to the environment, you'll notice that this is the exact same room as before, as evidenced by the tracks you see outside, on the ground, and in the air. If we cut back to when we were still playing as first, after you connect the first batter pouch, you see the shutters open. You can actually go outside the shutters just a little bit, and you can see the exact same area you just passed through as the second protagonist. The second packet of Creamy Creamy Lemon Screamy opened a door that you couldn't see, and the third packet caused the explosion, which we already went through. If you climb up the left side of the destroyed walkway in the room, you can actually map out exactly where everything was in the room, and you can see that exactly where it first was buried, there is now a large hole that had been carved out into the mound of organic cement. Also, uh, there is no pile discarded to the side or signs of digging. It looks more like it sagged in over time before being pulled down, which does, in the most cursed way imaginable, imply that the first protagonist survived by drinking and or eating the electric mayonnaise probably subsisting off of it for years, which makes this even more cursed than it already was, and explains why it seems to be drooling the cum shock all over the walls, and why it's so good at combining with living creatures. We'll get into that. Cutting back to the present, Second goes throughout the ship, 
Using various technologies, we get to see explicitly that the cum shock is used to power machinery. As when he unplugged a tube containing it, some giant video game cooling fans are turned off and he was able to pass through the gap between them. The pressure in those tubes clearly isn't enough to power them turning in this way. So they are containing a power source and this is one of several reasons why I think it's both a mutagenic and a power source. Uh, the other one is that the game explicitly tells us near the end. He then walks through those fans and we finally are reunited with the first protagonist. First jumps second recognizing that second looks just like how first used to look before first got transformed into a hideous skeleton faced monster first grapples second and digs their fingers into his stomach burying those fingers into his guts so that no matter what second can never get rid of them and survive now normally you would expect this to kill second but remember first has spent the last who knows how many years being buried in and consuming only the sweaty elixir of life so, when first buries their hands into Second's guts and begins trying to fuse with them, instead of dying, the two actually somehow begin fusing. Second instantly realizes he's not in mortal danger, and he realizes that the tail is connected to the exact tool he needs in order to traverse the environment and finish his mission. He's able to, in some way, influence First to help him out, as long as he doesn't try to disconnect First from him. He grabs the tool, stands, and continues walking now with first firmly connected to his spine. After solving some puzzles for a special key, he comes to a room containing some red eggs, which should sound familiar if you were paying attention to the lore. These contain adult buff-looking creatures, similar in physiology to the master race. Of course, we know that the moment they leave these eggs, they die. Second opens the gestation area for these eggs, pulls out a healing and ammunition storage device alongside one. This activity prompts one of the eggs to hatch, which results in its instant death. Second essentially ignores this, and he continues on through some doors before finding some monsters. See, most of the monsters are still dormant, but some have begun waking up. I call these monsters ants, and they spit acid at him. But otherwise, we already know why they're significant, so we can move on. Second spots some lines of ants which are forming living chains across the environment. He moves some large structures which breaks them, and then he goes through the opening he created. He comes across a second type of monster. I call that the parrot, and these are the ones that spit shards of bone at bullet-like speeds, which, you know, hurts a lot. Luckily, it is rather weak and small, so he kills it quickly. Second comes to a room which contains metal balls attached to chains. These are used for transporting the master race and slave race across different areas, and since they are so technically difficult to set up, I'm pretty sure they also serve as a bulkhead against the monsters, which are too stupid to solve puzzles like this. And this does make sense because this is one of only two ways to get to the temple, and the master race was trying to keep the monsters out of the temple at any cost. First begins now to occasionally, desperately claw open Second's stomach, hoping they can merge even further. Each time they claw Second open, they fuse more together. Right now, it isn't noticeable what's happening beyond the fact that First is burrowing its hands into Second's stomach, but it will be noticeable. Second finds a machine which injects some of that red egg fluid from before into his healing apparatus. With this, he's able to freely inject himself with the fluids and heal his flesh from having it being repeatedly clawed open. He doesn't realize, though, that this only makes him a more suitable host for first. Second runs through the area, fighting and dodging attacks as he runs past the mostly dormant monsters. Finally, he finds himself at a spare ball unit, which he needs to properly transport himself. First slashes into second even further. As they drain the blood and flesh from second, they repair a bit more of their original body. We don't see this yet, but we will. Second finds an arms chest which was used during the war against the monsters. He connects the gun attachment to First's tail, and he also finds bullets in the machine. They get studded onto his healing tool, and he's then able to reload his gun. Second solves some puzzles to get the tools needed to open pathways and move the ball, which is currently acting as an elevator up and down. And after solving the puzzles, Second finally has a transport ball where he needs it to be. And he uses his heavy machinery certification to operate the crane and move the ball into place. Second hops into the ball and is able to get into the back room. It's also overrun by monsters, and he starts heading down the hallway as... Here you go. Oh, look at him. Oh, he's taking a big old snack. 
Oh, he's crawling it up. I don't care, though. I'm good. I'm chilling. But I was not chilling. If you're paying close attention, you'll notice that Second Skin has begun looking a bit more green now. Second rushes along the pathway, laden with the bodies of long dormant monsters and ruined machinery. He opens gateways with the tool, and he finds another of those red egg rooms. This one has been completely consumed by the monsters. He keeps heading through, but... Oh, God. oh shit. Oh shit, he's consuming me. Oh shit, that's crazy, I didn't realize. That's kind of cool, actually. I hadn't noticed that until now. Yeah, so I am getting more decrepit. He's turning me into a... I don't know, some kind of tree? Bro, I am a genius. Second rides a path to another area, does a bit more fighting with a few more creatures. He finally meets the Brute, either gunning him down or managing to avoid him, or getting pile-driven, if you're me. Second descends a long elevator, finally leaving the main transportation hub and entering the area that ships directly to the temple. This area is the most overgrown out of all of them. Flesh has consumed all the walls and monsters cover everything. He meets the giant here. This is the only monster I didn't mention in the lore, as this creature, it's not a monster. Up until now, we've been walking up stairways made from giant bones and giant patches of skin, and we've seen massive, thick bones which were used in heavy construction, and the giants are an intentionally created monstrous creature. They were likely the first monster creature that's so different that it no longer even looks a bit humanoid. But we know that they were intentionally designed because they are completely docile. They won't attack even when provoked, and they can be split apart as raw building material. This one that we see is likely the last one. It sat atop the elevator leading to the only working transport to the temple, and it's been there for so long that it's fused with the elevator itself. And that elevator is locked on several levels, all of which are buried beneath layers of the giant's flesh. This somewhat implies that the Master Race intentionally left this giant here in order for it to form a natural barrier to keep the other monsters out. Second knows what he needs to do. And he immediately rips open the Mon Thrust in what is one of the coldest acts of video game violence I've ever seen. This man is ice cold and he cannot be stopped as multiple times he rips it apart. <clears throat> Anyways, he raises the rotating maze puzzle into place. This puzzle serves as a rise lower button for the elevator. And... Yeah, why are you doing this to me, huh? Oh, you, like, like, you don't have to claw into me to do that every time. You could, you could just grow on your own. Alright? Without clawing. Oh, god, I'm looking more tree than man now. In their attempt for recombination, first greedily consumes more of second. They fuse even further, and second's arms are now almost completely wrapped in the plant-like tendrils. But hey, at least he's got a gun! With the new gun and a freshly reloaded and refilled healing pack, Second is properly kitted out and ready for violence. He fights through more monsters, bang bang bang, raises all the puzzles, and after ripping open every orifice of the giant woman... Let's see what's over here. Oh, not again. Oh, no. I'm not gonna do it again. Don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it again. I'm not gonna do it again. I'm not gonna do it again. <laughs> Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. <laughs> he finally activates the elevator in what is truly the coldest act of video game violence I ever did not see. <laughs> I... I'm sure she's fine. I, I'm i sure that that didn't hurt her too badly and that she's okay. She's, she's, she's probably just like a little confused about the change in scenery. of the elevator, he gets quite the view of the temple built around the rift. Uh, he also gets to see what he did to the giant woman. Anyways, then first starts acting up again. 
Come on, man. Can't you just relax for five st Ugh! First plant-like tendrils have at this point eaten into Second's veins and body. They're now bursting out of skin on his legs. Soon, if Second doesn't do something about First, he'll be completely immobile, and he'll never complete his mission. Second, to the groaning protests of First, forces himself back to his feet and activates the transportation railroad. This is where we get to see the temple for the first time, and that the sky here is truly blue, indicating the oxygenated atmosphere. And damn, just what a view. Second enters the temple and sees the robot which is used to slice open people's minds and connect them to the almighty neural network. He can't use it yet though, it's not time yet. He descends the staircase and connects a vial made from a special, different type of red fluid. This one is darker than the egg fluid from before, and stored in smaller, specialized armored vials. The vial Second found is only halfway filled, so he takes it with him to properly fill it back up. He connects it to the extraction device and goes into the other room, containing fetus-like genetic experiments, which I mentioned earlier. These are the hyper-intelligent fetuses, the HIF, as I decided to call them. They're stored in armored pods, which protect them in their fight against the monsters. Second takes one of these pods and places it in a robotic suit made from the dead flesh of one of those buff egg people. Remember what I said about the dead flesh of the people who died as soon as they left the eggs and how it had some interesting effects? Well, here we see those effects at use. They are extremely strong, bulletproof, and can easily be interfaced with the developing Rift technology. The master race intended to create a homunculus out of this necrotic flesh, which would carry a special being. It would have a womb containing fluids extracted from the HIF and the bodies of those dead egg people, all to create a bulletproof, hyper-intelligent being, which would carry the combined consciousness of the entire neural network. They designed the homunculi based on the combat suit they built for the HIF during the Monster Wars early escalation. They designed these homunculus after they had sealed themselves in the temple and shut all the technology down. But because all the technology was down and the slave production area had already been overrun, when they were designing the homunculi, they didn't have the labor force or the ability to get more raw materials to mass produce a new HIF production line using less aggressive fetuses or non-armored capsules. The solution the Master Race came up with was to carefully deactivate one of the combat suits the HIF would normally sit in. And then, once it's in that combat suit, since the suit had been stripped of all functionality and armor, they bash open the HIF's container and take it to be extracted. And they put it into these little things, these like birthing chambers, it's gonna bring them back to life, right? Hello? Wakey, wakey. Oh my god! I'm sorry! I didn't realize that was gonna happen! I'm sorry! Death. What have I done?! God. Oh my god. Anyways, Second carries a dead HIF to the extraction machine, crushing it flat and draining its blood, which is likely mixed with the rift energy and whatever other fluids are already inside the vial. He takes the vial and puts it in the machine connected to the homunculi, activating the first one and finally finishing the first true homunculus. But he needs two, so Second goes back to do it again. But the disabled combat suit fell off the production line, and since the production line was designed to mass produce these combat suits for war, it immediately replaces it with a brand new battle-ready suit. At this point, Second is too injured and too immobilized from first slowly infecting him to be able to lift the broken down suit back up. He doesn't have the time to strip this new battle suit of its functionality. So he connects the HIF, it wakes up and immediately begins to go on a rampage. Second fights the HIF, attempting to dismantle it without any success. Finally, he does manage to smash his container, breaking its connection to the suit and killing it 
as it also cannot survive outside the red liquid, just like the beings whose dead flesh made up the suit containing it. Second takes the grenade launching arm from the mech suit, wildly upgrading his combat power, as he now has a weapon so strong it can blow holes in the temple structure. Likely, this is the same weapon responsible for most of the major degradation we've seen so far across the various structures we've passed through. He takes the fetus to the fetus deletus apparatus, and after crushing, it half fills the vial. He then goes back to finish what he started when he first decides to do a little trolling. Uh, oh god, what the fuck is that? Whoa, shit, what the hell? Oh, fuck, I'm like all... I'm looking weird now. Second's right arm now more resembles a tree than an arm. Luckily, it is still functional, though, as his arm is fused with first tail, which is fused with a grenade launcher attachment. Second is able to use it to shoot open a wall to get the final HIF container. He then activates yet another fresh combat suit with it, and the two begin to fight. Although this fight doesn't really last as long. Second grabs the HIF. He hoists it into his Groot-esque hands and carries a little bundle of love to the hydraulic press, deciding to do a little trolling of his own. Second takes the flask, now fully filled, and goes to activate the last of the homunculi needed to finish the great work of his people. Oh, he's doing it again. Man, man, chill. All right, let me finish what I'm doing. Oh, not my hand. This guy is making my skin crawl. Oh, that's gross. First has now consumed both of Second's arms and almost taken his nobility from his legs. Second can barely move at all, and First has taken the flask from him. They are storing it inside of Second's guts and trying to break it within their grip. It's finally time to end this relationship. Because First is still totally invested in keeping Second alive so they can fuse into one, Second is able to get First to grab the healing apparatus and heal him. Second then rewards that loyalty by shoving his hand into some type of machine. This is likely an early prototype of the tubes we've been seeing that graft the spear key onto humanoid arms. The machine then slices into him a bunch of times, but because First has practically consumed Second's arms, it mostly slices off First's tendrils, freeing Second and forcing First to retreat their consumption. Second runs to a specialized machine, hoping to end this once and for all. First panics and begins ripping open Second's stomach, desperately trying to stop him, but it's too late. With his stomach splayed open, there's nothing for First to hold onto anymore, and Second uses a claw device to rip First out of him. This device was likely used to forcefully tear people apart in early combination experiments, as one person connects to it and can see the thing combining to them on their back. It was likely a method of dealing with problems like First. And as we use this machine to rip off First, we see their face again. Before, when we saw First in the slave production facility, they were a skeleton-headed monster, but now they have a human face. They've been consuming the flesh and blood from Second to regrow their human features as they fuse into one being, showing that just like Second, First still has that obsession with the idea of fusion wired into them. But that since First has lost their intelligence, First no longer has any awareness of the grand plan to fuse everything into creating the god being, and just wants to absorb Second and then slowly consume everything. The claw device massively moves First as it rips them away. It's designed to hold onto the being it pried free of combination, but because First isn't just any being, but a super lizard-like being which has soaked up the electro dong water for what must have been years, First uses their strength to pry themselves free of the claw machine, but due to being injured, they scamper up the wall to retreat and recover. Second activates the other homunculus and is raised onto an altar to be the last of the master race to join the neural network and be combined to form the god being. He connects himself to the machine that will hold his organs so he'll always be able to feel some baseline amount of pain to keep himself awake during this process. And okay, get ready because now it gets way weirder. A tube then rises up and connects to his erect love sausage to extract some fresh trouser gravy right from the source. This is then run through tubes that pass near the rift, absorbing some rift energy and turning it into the mutagenic power we now know and love. 
This power source is then used to activate the robot, which slices him open in several places, splays out his skin even more, all while he's still being jackhammered by the automatic sucky suctioneer. The robot then saws open his skull, removes the top of it, and connects his exposed brain to the neural network. Psychically, through the network, Second takes control of one of the two pregnant homunculi. He then has that homunculus connect one of the surgical arms of that robot to its back so he can repeatedly stab himself in the liver to keep himself awake and semi-aware of what's happening. Second takes control of the second homunculus, grafting a metal spear key onto its wrist. For the first time, we see this process be carried out in an instant and painless way. As these spear keys were designed to be compatible with the Master Race, but they were truly meant for the homunculi and the resultant god being they would birth. Also, this is where I saw that the homunculi are actually made from the dead corpses of the previous beings. You can see the exposed skeleton on the back of their heads, kind of similar to first when we first saw them, uh, which indicates that the homunculi are made from the dead flesh of either those egg people I mentioned earlier, who had the correct skin tone for them to be the same person, which is why I think they're the same, or they're made from the master race members who died before the neural network was completed and their skin color changed due to the preservation process or exposure to the rift. Uh, I think it's the egg people, uh, like I said, because of the skin color and because the musculature matches, but uh, overall, it really doesn't change much either way. I just, I'm covering my bases. Second carries his own body towards the rift. We get to see the statues made from the ancestor species, the first people ever to be exposed to the rift. Decades, maybe even centuries of being placed so close to the rift has caused the stone to slowly be dissolved away, revealing their mummified bodies beneath, and the rift is now sucking their olden flesh out from their tombs, consuming it along with the entire planet. Second finally switches back to his own perception. Now that he's in the neural network, all that's left to do is have the other homunculus pass into the rift while he gets to witness the creation of the god being with his own eyes. And then the product of his work, the work of his people will finally come to fruition. They'll finally create the ultimate race they've been striving for. Anyways, a second in his perception is now ready to pass the homunculi into the rift to absorb the energy and do whatever it is that they'll do when first returns, now fully healed, and they tackle Second to the ground, disconnecting him from the neural network. First finally rips through him, tangling the two together and connecting them for eternity. Second desperately reaches towards the necrotic homunculus, which stands idly waiting for commands from the network. If only he had a little more time, he was so close. If he had just a little longer, he could have done it. But time is all he'll be given. Second lies there, unable to move. As First slowly consumes him, the two finally do merge. First begins to take root, and as their flesh is allowed to spread, it soaks up the energy from the open rift before them. Soon, all that's left of the two is a living tree. Made from the bodies of First and Second, supplied by energy from the rift, it slowly grows and grows, watching and observing the rift before it for eternity. Years centuries, maybe even eons pass as the tree continues growing. Now a massive tree, its wood and roots cover the entire temple, and have long since blocked any entrances and exits from the room containing the rift. Long after even that, after everything has been buried, first finally dies. Their wooden body begins to rot and turn brittle, and it stops supplying nutrients to second and the wood containing him. Second finally wakes up, still alive, and rips himself free from the brittle wood. The time spent inside the tree, being constantly exposed to the rift, slowly repaired his body. He now has an intact skull again, his organs are held in again, but some things are different. His mouth is visible now, and he's mutated into a being which could survive everything that he went through. An unimaginable amount of time in utter silence, something that even first could not survive through. Second, desperately crawls across the root-covered floor, towards the wood-wrapped rift before him. Now, having spent an eternity fused with First, and sharing First memories as he desperately chases down the rift one last time, he thinks about how he got there and what the two of them went through. He thinks back to First desperately crawling across the base of the Ring Canyon towards an unusable spaceship which had been converted into the slave production facility. For those who played the game, you know that this is how it began. 
So yeah, the entire game is a flashback. It's second, recalling the now combined memories of himself and first as he crawls towards the rift. I'm not sure why he's still trying to get to it. The homunculi are now long dead and buried underneath a bunch of wood from first. I assume that he thinks the centuries of himself slowly mutating turned him into a species that can absorb more rift energy. Maybe he just wants godhood for himself, or maybe the eons of imprisonment drove him insane, and now he's just operating off that programmed in desire he had when he was birthed. And all that's left of it now is just to continue going towards the rift until he throws himself into it like a moth to a fire. We already saw that the constant mutation caused by rift exposure could change how an individual perceives that programmed in desire and can pervert it. Like with how first started seeing the idea of combining themselves with other people. They forgot the whole mission behind it and everything there and just became obsessed with absorbing and combining with second. But anyways, that is the entire story of Scorn, or it's my best attempt at understanding and interpreting it. A lot of why stuff is happening does seem to be interpretational to me, uh, but I think that I got the plot of the game as right as I could get it. Like that first is actually the monster on your back the entire game. That's explicitly shown to us. It's easy to miss, but it's like, it's very explicit. The fact that the beginning is actually the end, that one I picked up on instantly, but I imagine some people may have missed it, and I'm sure other people will have other interpretations of the history of this world, since we don't explicitly see any of it. It's just hinted at through level design and artwork and architecture of this world. There's a lot of ways it can be taken, and I think that's pretty cool. My version of the game can be totally consistent with my world, and totally different from your version of the game, which is also totally consistent with that same world. And that's really cool. A lot of games go for more subtle, environmental storytelling, but then it's like four disconnected newspaper clippings about how Grimace is out there killing people. It's nice to have a game that's finished on release with this kind of environmental storytelling that still has an actual plot to it, all right? That's, that's pretty refreshing. <laughs> finished on release, it's pretty refreshing. I mean, the game's not perfect. There were a lot of moments that myself and other people I know who played the game didn't like. A lot of the puzzles didn't really contribute anything to the lore, so I kind of glossed over them. They were just in there to seemingly drag on the runtime. Uh, the level design could have been a bit better as well. And I mean the literal map design, not the art style. I loved the art style. It was really weird and unique, but I was constantly getting lost. And if they were better about their use of lighting and the environment, then that could have been avoided. But yeah, it's a new developer, this is their first IP, and given what they were trying to do with having us revisit the production facility years later, I'm really not holding it against them. I think they did enough right and enough in a really interesting way that I can overlook what was annoying and still say this is a fun game and I'd recommend it. Anyways, do you have a different interpretation of the story? Do you agree with mine or do you have your own little theories? I'd love to see them. So you should put them in the comments below if you've got something like that. And again, I am a very small channel, so it would mean all the difference to me if you would subscribe or share this with someone, if you found it interesting or funny or informative. Uh, this is my first time doing a deep dive into a game's lore and story, and I have a lot of fun doing it. I like replayed the entire game while taking notes in a notebook and while seeing how far along the Ring Canyon walls I could see. And I felt like, I don't know, some kind of armchair archeologist, which was really fun. So I'd probably want to do this again sometime. If you subscribe to my channel, like or share, all that will encourage me to do it again sometime. There are a lot of games I could talk about like this and I don't know, it's been fun. So please subscribe and if you did, then thanks. And that's it for this video, goodbye.